And welcome to the Supernatural Track here at Continual. I'm your host, Kelsey Martin, and tonight we are talking about growing up, Dean, growing up Dean Winchester. I'm not sure where we'll take this conversation, but I know it will be fun. Let's start with our wonderful panelists introducing themselves, starting with Carol. Hi, I'm Carol Stokes. Uh, I have been a fan of Supernatural since season three, started writing fanfic in 2012, and I am also a co-host of the Spotify podcast. So get this, the lore of supernatural fan fiction. Oh, fun. Very good. Amy? Oh, hi. I'm Amy. Yeah, it's almost the same. I started probably season three, wrote some fan fiction in 2012, <laughs> but I don't host a podcast about it. Just been a huge fan. The funny thing is we were supposed to be in Lawrence, Kansas tonight. We just didn't make it that far because there were storms in Nashville. So we had to stop early, but it would have been so perfect. <laughs> Lynn. Hi, I'm Dr. Lynn Zabernis. I'm a licensed psychologist and a professor at Westchester University. I have been a fan of Supernatural since the very beginning. And I've written, I think, six books on the show, the most recent books with the cast of Supernatural. Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Kensing. I have been a fan of the show since pretty much the very beginning. Um, I recall watching season one on network television back when you had to wait for the episodes to come on every week. And I um, took a brief hiatus at some point and then came back to it. I have dabbled in fanfic and I also write uh, queer romance, um, mostly but not exclusively MM and sometimes with tentacles. Very good. Janet. Hi, I'm Janet Walden West, and I was lucky enough to discover Supernatural just as it premiered, and I've been a fan ever since. Um, I don't write fanfic, also I do love it, but I do write urban fantasy and paranormal romance that owe a lot to Supernatural. Very good. Melissa? Hi, I'm Melissa. I have been a fan since the pilot aired. I don't write fanfic, but I'm a voracious reader. And an occasional guest here on Super on um, the Continual. <laughs> and, and I'm Gail C. Martin and Morgan Bryce. As Gail, I write epic and urban fantasy. As Morgan, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. And all my modern worlds are ones that Sam and Dean could walk into and feel right at home. Fell in love with the show halfway through season 11. Binge watched 11 seasons in four months for the start of season 12. I uh, fell down the rabbit hole. And I've been an obsessed fan ever since. So... Growing up Dean Winchester, we get glimpses of Dean's past from the flashback episodes. Um, and of course, fanfic gives us a lot of territory to fill in the gaps. And we know that a lot of Dean's background was shaped by the tragedy that sent them on the road. And as I'm sure Melissa will mention, John's A plus parenting. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, really this is talking about what, what was Dean's growing up like uh, that we can kind of infer from what we see in canon and maybe some of the theories that have stuck with us the most from uh, Fanon. And, uh, you know, which episodes have given us some insights on that. And um, we'll just kind of go, the, go from there on the making of Dean Winchester. Carol, uh, let's look at uh, what, do, what do we pick up from canon? Um, I'm going to talk about the glimpse we get in Something Wicked, which is one of my favorite, favorite episodes. Uh, and I think really sets the stage for both our perception of Dean in his childhood <laughs> and John Winchester's A-plus parenting. Um that the the tenant that he lived by as instilled from his father but uh really incalculated into his personality as he's a as he grows up is he must take care of sammy 
his number one job is taking care of Sammy. And we see this demonstrated, like we've seen it all along, you know, he's, he's watching out for his little brother and all this kind of stuff. But in this episode, we see a young, young, young Dean. Uh, what is he like eight tops uh, in charge of his? He's 10. He's 10. Okay. So Sammy is six. Look, I can math. Uh, <laughs> Um, and they're alone at Christmas. Uh, there's, we never see John in the entire episode. Uh, catch me before I get confused on episodes. I have two episodes in my head right now and they're both jostling. Um, something wicked is the Striga. The Striga. Yeah, not Christmas. We do see John. Okay. You know what the other one I'm thinking of. <laughs> yep. All right. Do it. So we see, so he's old, he's younger than in Something Wicked. He's not 10, is he? Yeah, okay. it happens in like 1989 and he was born in 79. So he's like All nine right. or 10. You're so right. Yeah, You're so right. he's 10, right? So John, we see him, he leaves. What are his parting words? Take care of your, you know, Dean doesn't even let him say, yeah, yeah, take care of Sammy. Well, this is a lot to ask of a 10 year old. And not only that, this is something Dean's done his entire life. I mean, there's never been Mary. And we don't know at what point John started sloughing all of this off onto him. Sammy goes to bed. Dean's like, I got to get out of this motel room. <laughs> One of many that he has lived his life in. He literally goes like a couple doors down to play in the arcade. Sammy's at risk. John comes back. Uh, yeah, he's furious. He's furious. <laughs> Dean is left with this uh, sense of guilt so vast that here we are, <laughs> years later, decades later, <laughs> he still feels guilty about it between what John has laid on him and what he has taken into himself as his, uh, you know, his raison d'etre is take care of Sammy. Um, and it's heartbreaking. It's really, it's really tough. We see what a weight it is on him. We see the weight that is on him because he not only did not take care of Sammy adequately and Sammy was in danger, but John was furious with it. John didn't take any of it on himself. He laid it all on Dean as well. So, <laughs> So with, it's real clear here. It is really clear. Uh, Dean is all about taking care of Sam. And that's it. He doesn't have, it's take care of Sam. And after that, it's hunt the mouse, hunt, hunt the one, who, the thing who killed mom. And in the meantime, as many, you know, sons of bitches as they can. So that is it. That is the scope of Dean's life. And it's really really sad okay it's interesting i think because about this particular episode um and i don't mean to sort of jump in front of amy but no, please we're talking no, about this episode no you know like it's really hard for dean to confess to sam why or how the striga escaped because dad was hunting the reason why they're there in this town is because dad is hunting the striga like the striga's already been attacking other kids in this town and so he has he's locked the kids in the room because he's out hunting you know the big bad um and it's really hard for dean to confess to sam that the reason why the striga wasn't killed by their father is because Dean goes off to the arcade just down the road and abandons Sam. And, you know, they know then, John knows then, and they know now that the Striga goes after children. And so by doing that, Dean puts Sam at risk. But also, like, they've done this before. You know, he's like, yeah, yeah, dad, you've told me this a million times. Like, they've done this before and nothing's happened, right? And it's just boring. They've been there for three days and nothing's happened. And so why three can't he just go there? Like, and, and a lifetime. Three and a lifetime, there right? And, and, and a lifetime before. <laughs> and then at the end of the episode, Sam says that it's too bad that the kid in the episode, you know, the current day kid, Michael, is going to know forever that there are monsters in 
that there's something in the dark and that Sam wishes that he could have had that innocence. And Dean, at the end of this episode, he looks at Michael, the kid from the episode, and he looks at Sam and he says, yeah, I wish you could have had that too. Because Dean has completely abandoned the idea that he could have been innocent. And it's just, he's just sad a little bit that both Michael, the kid of present time, and that Sam couldn't have been innocent throughout this. But Dean's just like, well, I was never an innocent kid. <laughs> like that, that door was closed ages ago. So it's a little, it's just, oh. but you know, like John sends them on this hunt specifically so that Dean can, you know, fix it, can close that loop and redeem himself. I and you know, I don't even, I don't even think that's why he did it. I feel mm -hmm. like John did it to rub his nose in it. Oh, I think you John let this it. thing get away so you can freaking go back there and kill it now. That's how I felt about that it. That is at 110% because yeah, this was not John closure. No, the thing that kills me about this episode is it's clear that this is not the first time John's left them alone. A oh, 10 year old. Absolutely. And a six-year-old who are in more danger than a normal 10 and six-year-old because the monsters know who John is. So all they have to do is track back to the hotel. Those boys were in even more danger than your average 10 and six-year-old. And it's not that Dean should have learned a lesson from this to take care of Sammy. It's that maybe John should have learned a lesson. Take care of his kids. I'm sorry. This episode is is the one. This is the, like I like I'm running uh, the running joke is because I really do John. I am the the biggest member of the John Winchester A plus parenting um, fan club. I can't. Yeah. I'm gonna meet. I'm gonna, I get to meet JDM later this year, and I can't wait to like get him to sign my A plus sign. Oh, no. um, I am. I'm gonna. I'm gonna ask him to to sign it. Um, <laughs> And I'm not going to explain it. That's fine. But like, we really get to see like, it, like this is such a, a great example of the relationships. John's not even on screen. And my loathing of him is formed <laughs> from this episode because how do, not, not that how do you leave your kids alone? Okay. He was hunting the monster, but that you don't change the behavior after something bad happens because you're reminded that a 10 year old should not be responsible for a six-year-old dean we'd have no story there would be no dean winchester without that trauma yes. right <laughs> like that's the whole thing yeah my thing jumping in since miss morgan miss gail interested me before um i like all the hints that john was kind of a straight up abusive to dean and that dean protected sam from it especially in that episode with the powers are just starting. I do not remember names, seasons, but he, I think it was that one. Yeah, because he's like, that could have been me. He says about the kid who killed his parents, that could have been me. And Dean was like, no, it couldn't be because I didn't let that happen. You know, and I love that. That I wish they'd gone into that a little bit more, you know? And I do like the that they bring up that John and Sam are like really similar and that's why they butt heads so much too yeah sam's comment was a little more tequila a little less hunting and that could have been me right yeah, yeah and it stuck with me all the yeah. whole time you know was, i thought it was really interesting and john the thing with jensen eccles doing dean is his face says so much right it, it says almost more than his dialogue a lot the expressions on his face and in that episode it was very i thought he was saying a lot with his face that he wasn't things and since sam has never been responsible for dean he doesn't have to you know like when you have an emotionally emotionally abusive parent and you monitor their emotions because you need to know how to react dean knows every one of sam's emotions but sam has never had to monitor dean that closely as a kid right? and not not only does dean know every one of sam's emotions he knows every one of John's emotions because right. talk about yeah. monitoring. He is constantly monitoring John yeah, he's because awesome. he's going to have to be the one to respond. Mm -hmm. He's going to be the one that he has to decide and, and uh, on the, you know, uh, the blink of an eyelid, does he have to jump in and protect Sammy? Oh, yeah. Does he have to deflect John? What does he have to do to maintain any kind of status quo? And yeah. to be doing that as a child is devastating. 
devastating. Yeah. Like, how can we ever wonder that Dean, in fact, does not have for a long time the emotional maturity to have any kind of relationship? You know, he's he's damaged from the get go. And I love well, and it. we and I we see, it. yeah, and we see in fight in the fight scenes early in the in the seasons, Dean always puts himself between John and Sam, but with his back to Sam, protecting Sam, mm -hmm. facing off with John. So siding with Sam, even if he didn't always say so, but mm -hmm. the body language speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. Then. Yeah, I mean, just picking up on what everybody's saying, it's interesting to me, too, that increasingly throughout the, the whole run of the series, we see Sam acknowledging that more and more and more, that, you you know, you always protected me. You were mm -hmm. always the one who was there protecting me. In the beginning of the series, Sam is still really young, you know? Yeah. He's still yeah. a college-age, forgive me, people in college, but kid. He's still a college-age kid, and he doesn't really have that perspective. People, people who are just coming into their own and individuating don't want to be protected. They resent that protection. They don't want to need that protection. And it's interesting to watch Sam over the course of the series really appreciate it and start to realize just how deep and pervasive that was and also start to realize the price that Dean paid for it, which is what all of us are talking about. Like that that hypervigilance that he has about people's emotions, yes. that gets in the way of being able to have an actual authentic emotional relationship with someone because you're too busy waiting for the other shoe to fall to just meet someone where they are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's he's avoidant of relationships because that's not how he, he thinks he has to be hypervigilant with everyone all the time, except Sam. Mm -hmm. um, oh. It's I was not... going to, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, too, that that speaking of A plus parenting, there are I've seen fan theories that maybe in something wicked, John actually was using his sons as mm -hmm. bait because I thought he so. shows, he shows yeah. up like what are the chances that he would have showed up exactly at the time that the Striga is going to get Sam. I mean, right. that's, a, that's a hell of a coincidence that he was off somewhere else, but he shows up exactly at the right time. So, and I, I mean, that's a, that's a horrible, horrible thing to think that really makes it way, way darker, but I don't know. Some of the pieces do seem to kind of fit there. Mm -hmm. Does John <laughs> ever come back early from a hunt? If the, you know, he's going to be out there until the creature is caught. Yeah, why so, did he? Why would he have why come, did back he come back if he didn't catch it? Unless, I mean, I guess you could say maybe we don't know this. I guess maybe he could have gotten its trail and followed it, and it went back to the motel that the boys were at. I mean, that that would be plausible. I, I will tell you that from what I've heard from Jeffrey Dean Morgan, this this is not his interpretation. I mean, he has the most <laughs> charitable interpretation of John Winchester. Not that he, I think, doesn't acknowledge things that John did that he as a dad would never do, but he is very adamant that John was trying to protect his boys, where I see a lot of, John was trying to protect his boys, but that wasn't his sole motivation, yeah. and sometimes that got trumped by his other motivations. For Not time. even his primary motivation. No, <laughs> no, no, that's why it got yeah. trumped by the other one. Yeah. 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 Janet? I mean, you can count me in on Melissa's A plus parenting train. I mean, Dean wasn't just, you know, the center of the family, the one that held them both together because he was the peacemaker and he put family ahead of everything else, like his father supposedly did, but not so much. But he was always set up to fail because he is a kid and he is supposed to take the role of father right away, you know, with his brother. And there's a four, you know, that four year age difference between them. They're children. He hasn't ever had the kind of life where he would even see actual parenting. He's been on the road, you know, with, with his father who is obsessed. So he is trying to parent you know, his little brother. And at the same time, he's never, ever going to completely be successful because the whole point is protect Sammy, but they are in the middle of hunting monsters and they always will be. So it is just like a zero sum game for him. 
And it, I, that is just so much of him through the series. He never really had a childhood. So I think that is why he has, you know, some of those cute, you know, childish quirks, like, you know, I'm going to eat the entire bag of Halloween candy till I'm sick, because he never really got to be a kid, you know, even when John was around, he was still the parent who had to protect Sammy. Mm -hmm. Melissa? Um, I got to talk about bad boys, since we're talking yes. about Dean not <laughs> having, I, I'm saying it for you, Anna, because you and me are on this. <laughs> Anna. <'cause> I, <laughs> um, bad boys. John leaves him in the halfway house, foster home, whatever you want Form to call school. Sonny's. Where, yeah. He leaves him there to teach him a lesson while he's off doing whatever. Um, Dean gets a taste of normal life, high school, Ooh. success, sports, somebody actually parenting him instead of him mm -hmm. having to parent his younger sibling. Mm -hmm. It's normal, and Dean thrives. And Sonny comes to him when the Impala pulls up, and John Winchester's honking the horn. You know, he doesn't even come in and get him. And, I, I have a real. Pro I just you could tell. I, you could tell the depth of my love for John Winchester. Um, but Sonny, Sonny, you know, says, you know, I, I'll try. I'll if you want to stay, I'll fight to keep not meaning like a physical fight, but he's gonna, gonna go to bat because he recognizes there's something wrong here. And Dean looks out the window. And it's not that he sees his dad. He sees Sam with the window open, with the airplane. Now Sam's like 12 here. So- Although he looks more like six. He, but looks, he, he, looks, he, he looks more younger. like six or eight. He yeah. looks way younger. And- my thought was, well, he looks younger because he has been, he's still at that age where Dean has been able to shelter him so much. So even though Sam is aware of the bad stuff and he's probably already starting to do, do research because, you know, he's 12, he can read. Um, he's still got that childlike innocence and Dean is leaving Sonny, he's leaving his chance for the apple pie life because he loves his brother and he has to protect Sammy. And he, so, without even hesitating, he leaves. Yeah. And so speaking of this episode, so in, um, so this happens, uh, the bad boys happens when Dean is 16, right? Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. in, in, in one of the season two episodes, one of the early season two episodes, Bloodlust, um, Dean is talking with Gordon, the hunter, and who turns out to be yep. terrifyingly bad. And he says, he's like relating a story. And he's like, so I picked up this crossbow and I hit, hit that ugly sucker with a silver tipped arrow and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Sammy's waiting in the car. And my dad takes this thing into the woods with me and, you know, we burn him down. And, and he says, and I'm sitting there and I'm looking into the fire and I'm thinking to myself, I'm 16 years old. Kids my age are worried about pimples, prom dresses, prom dates. I'm seeing things they'll never even know, never even dream of. So right then I just sort of, and he sort of kind of trails off and Gordon's like, embrace the life. And he says, yeah. And it makes me wonder, like, so he says in this tale that he's telling to Gordon that he's 16 and we know that he's 16 in Bad Boys. And so did this, is this the werewolf fight that Dean got into when Sonny noticed the bruises on his arms? Because Dean has does it happen, or does or it does happen, it happen after, after? Right, like, because he's he embraced the life. And says, yeah. I can't have that. So I'm going to throw myself now into this. Yeah. And so you I know? don't know where that, when that happens in that, but I do know that in bad boys, you know, when Sonny sees the bruises on Dean's arm, he says, he looks at Dean and he says, did the deputy do that? And Dean scoffs like, yeah, like that would happen. That's it. And then he says, did your old man do it? And Dean looks like so outraged at the idea that his father would do something like that to him. I am a little bit, like I do, I do see John's A, a plus parenting, but I'm a little bit more of a John apologist, a little bit more of a John apologist than most. But, and Dean is like, absolutely not. That was not my father. It's a werewolf. And so like, I don't know, like, is this the werewolf that happens? Or is this like the, you know, the, the, the fight after the, he leaves studies where he's embraced the life? I think it's, it's interesting, interesting because, you know, we've, 
we've changed how parenting works over the decades and the expectations. Mm -hmm. And yes. we're a lot more careful about supervision now and yes. that's socially expected than we were even in the 80s yes. when Sam and Dean would have been growing up, certainly in the decades before that. And I think about my mother-in-law who was a child in the 30s and she was the oldest of five. And some of the stories she would tell about watching her younger brother, her younger brothers, uh, and what they were allowed to do in this small town, very small town where they grew up. Um, and it was very much, well, when the streetlights come on, come home mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, but they were in a small town where everybody knew them. They weren't hunting monsters. They weren't in a dangerous profession. Uh, it was farm country. Um, so you could get hit by cars. You could probably get, you know, maybe run into a cougar, maybe. Uh, if you. But mostly um, there wasn't a whole lot of threats. So to let the kids sort of run loose, okay, that's one thing. But when you're going from skeevy motel to skeevy motel with two little boys, and you're also fighting apex predators out there with supernatural abilities, the neighbors aren't looking out for you. You know, we always joke that you couldn't take a walk in my husband's hometown without four people offering you a ride home, which is very true. But that's not the cozy little small town world Sam and Dean had. They were always strangers. Um, even without the paranormal monsters, there would have been human monsters at those truck stops. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I say something too about that. There would have been other kids in those motels in the same situation because it's a class thing too. There's very, there are plenty of kids who grow up in motels like that, completely mm -hmm. unsupervised while their parents go to work. Yes. You know, or, or their mom goes to work. They wouldn't have been the only kids. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I started babysitting when I was 12. Yeah. Right. Like I long before I had my own my dr uh, driver's license, I had to be driven to the bait. Like the, yeah. the dad had to come drive to my parents house, pick me up, drive me back to his place so that he and his wife could go out for dinner while I babysat their children. And then when he came home, he had to drive me back to my parents house because I didn't have a car because I was 13, you know, yeah. and so like the idea of of like 10 is 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 young for this <laughs> 10 is for sure young for this but I definitely was I'm the oldest of four I definitely supervised my kids you know my sisters and took care of them and so you know in the, I don't I don't I don't, I, don't no, 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 I think the difference is like I was an 80s child and I was out the door at the beach from eight o'clock in the morning until five o'clock at night and I couldn't swim and I was eight or nine, and I was there all day by myself. I could have drowned, nobody would have known. That's insane. Um, but, the, but the difference is that there was, I went home and there was someone home eventually. Dean and Sam were left alone for days on end. And I think that that's the difference between being a latchkey kid or growing up at a hotel, or, you know, in the eighties, we were all, you know, the streetlights came on, that's when we came home, is that these kids were, alone for days at a time not just you know dad is at work and then he comes home at night to feed them <laughs> and I don't think it's just the it's not just the being left alone thing I think the the thing that damaged Dean more than that was sort of the emotional manipulation mm -hmm. I mean the most horrifying moment of yeah. something wicked that we started out talking about is when John gets back and saves Sam the look that he gives yeah. Dean, mm -hmm. it, even without any words, that just absolute disdain that he looks at his son with, with a hundred percent blame. I find that one of the most chilling moments in the mm -hmm. whole, the whole series. And Dean absorbs so much guilt, even with bad boys. We're talking about bad boys now. The most chilling part of that is Dean starting out the the trying to explain to Sam he's apologizing he's saying 
you know, right, that I, I never left because I wanted to. Like, there were times dad sent me away, and I didn't want to go. I wasn't trying to abandon you. He feels guilty about John dropping him off at the boys' home. Like, he is just he is just a ball of guilt. That's just his defining. <laughs> and that's the worst thing that John did to him, mm -hmm. I think. And I totally feel that that scene, and I know others have a different interpretation. My interpretation is that when Sam's hanging out the car, he's bait. He yeah, does, I wouldn't be surprised. Encourages him to do that because he knows if Dean sees him, he's yeah. toast. You know. Anna? Yeah, I don't think that I don't think that John said to Sam, "Hey, dude, hang out the car window no, so I don't that your think brother he was can that see overt, you." But I, I think, think he, he manipulated probably manipulated the situation. I don't. I don't think that he manipulated the situation to create it. I think that he probably saw it and was like, "Oh, that'll work," and then he You're let it happen. <laughs> You're kinder than I am. <laughs> I don't I think John did it. Yeah. I, I don't think John did it because he was a horrible person. I I, I actually I think no, John, it was loved, a... John loved his children. I think yes. he absolutely did. But he was so damaged and his own coping skills for losing his wife were so pathological that I really don't think he realized. I don't think Jeffrey Dean Morgan is delusional. Like I, I think the version of John that he sees exists, but he just got so warped with his response to this horrible loss that he didn't see. I really don't think he saw all the damage that he didn't want to, but I don't think he saw it. And I don't and I don't think he could he could go forward without Dean because Dean is so crucial to him, not even just being his son, but being the one who takes care of Sammy and you know, being the one that that John leans on. He is yeah. it for any kind of emotional support. I know what I wanted to, since you guys are all so knowledgeable about this, I'm always curious about <laughs> Dean without Sammy, when Sammy was in school. And then Dean's dad leaves him too, because I know somebody said that Dean holds the family together, but it's really Sam, right? Because when Sam's gone, the family breaks up and Dean's kind of like the mom. So he's like so alone those years. Yes. There's, there's, a huge, there's a huge, there's a huge, uh, section of fan fiction yeah. to that I wrote <laughs> and address it addresses not only <laughs> Sam's here. time in college but yeah. what happens to Dean how does yeah. Dean deal with this and I'll tell you one thing in general it's not good <laughs> it's I want to come back I want to come back and get Janet because she's been quiet so <laughs> Janet. weigh in Janet <laughs> the thing that strikes me the most is that yes John was a bad parent Mary was honestly not much better because, you know, at the at point of crisis, she decided, you know, saving my husband is more important than than future children um, that I could have. You know, when she dies, John is more fixated on what happened to his wife than the children in front of him. So Dean is mother and father both, and he he can't do the job. So his self-esteem is just like tanked under all that cockiness and all of that competence as a hunter. He does not have a great sense of himself or he doesn't really value himself. Sammy is more important. Innocent people are more important. Everything is more important than he is. So that is like the true horror, I think, mm -hmm. of Supernatural. Poor baby. Well, and, and I want to bring up um, a very supernatural Christmas, which is again where we see the boys alone in a hotel room at Christmas, and Dean's trying to hold up. Uh, he's trying to to save Sam's feelings, but John isn't going to come, and Dean knows John isn't going to come, even though he tries to to cheer Sam up. And I think that one always hits me because my dad always chose work over being home at Christmas, even though we didn't need the money that bad. He liked making the money he could make at a premium on Christmas. And so he wasn't home. And mom and I did best we could. And I, you know, it's been decades and I still feel that, well, we just weren't as important uh, because it wasn't a got to pay the rent. It was, no, you just like the money, the premium pay. 
And John isn't getting paid to hunt monsters, but he has a choice here. Mm -hmm. He could be home on Christmas and the monsters are more important. This validation that he's getting from hunting the monsters, like the validation my dad got from the premium pay of volunteering to work the holiday, matters more when you come down to it than the kids. It is a choice. It isn't a, you don't understand, we wouldn't have had money to put food on the table. No, it's a choice. And that's, Sam's not aware of it, but Dean is. And mm -hmm. so Dean is very much, I think, even at the age he is in a very supernatural Christmas, aware that his dad could be home. Mm -hmm. He could take a night off mm -hmm. and he chooses mm -hmm. not to be. Yeah. And so yeah. he he tries to make it as normal as he can for Sam. And, you know, he fails spectacularly by feeling the wrong presence. But he didn't he know. He didn't know. <laughs> uh, next time he breaks into somebody's house, he's going to unwrap it first. Right. Um, but, you know, it's a thought that counts. But I think that there's that sense. There's a, there is physical abandonment and then there's emotional abandonment. Mm -hmm. And out of all the other nights of the year that John wasn't there, the idea that even on Christmas, the hunt came first, that hurts. Yeah. And that's a hurt mm -hmm. that doesn't go away because yeah. it's choice and you weren't number one. Yeah. And, and speaking that sits there for, I think that sits there permanently with Dean even though he did a lot to blunt it from hurting Sam in the same way. Yeah. And I think we, we see the, the sort of um, end result of this and the outcome of this in after school special, um, when the boys come back to a high school where there's been some murders and it turns out that they were there, you know, some years ago when Dean was 18 and like this, he's a senior and he's, about to drop out of high school and this might actually be the last high school that he goes and rolls in and Sam is um Sam has an interaction with this English teacher who you know is sort of one of the first teachers to like recognize how smart he is and ask him what he really wants to do and does he really need to go into the family business and Dean is dating um Amanda Heckerling and um, she invites him to go meet his parents. And he's a little bit like, oh, wait, what new things? And then he cheats on her with somebody else. And she catches him in the broom closet that they've been making out in with another girl. And she says to him, I'm not mad, Dean. I thought maybe like underneath your whole, I could give a crap bad boy thing that there was something more going, going on. But she accuses him of just being lonely. And he's like, I'm not lonely. You don't know anything about me. I'm a hero. I save lives. And it's true. He is a hero and he does save lives, but also like he's so distraught by these accusations because it's so true, right? Like he is lonely. He is so alone. Sam is already starting to pull away from him. Sam is already starting to think about maybe going to college. Sam, you know, his father's has parked them there in the school for several months and you know, they're doing, he's doing whatever. And Dean is like, I'm 18 years old. <laughs> what is my life going to be? Like, what is it going to be? It's going to be temporary girls. And although his idea of a date for this girl, her, him, a bucket of popcorn, extra butter, and the midnight screening of I Spit on Your Grave, which as it turns out is like a late seventies, like Sexual horror. And, horrible, and, and, yeah. <laughs> and revenge fantasy movie and yeah. it's been banned in several countries and it may or may not glorify violence against women and he's just like I sounds like a date night to me theater when it came out we saw it <laughs> yeah, but then again, i mean the, the revenge part of it sounds fun but the the no, 30 wasn't. minutes of the actual scene itself yeah. sounds less fun compared to a lot of other movies that were out in the 70s that might not have been the worst choice <laughs> maybe not <laughs> let me, let me toss out date movie yeah let me toss out one more because we're running out of time and that is uh the one we see in season 15 drag me away from you uh sam and dean are a little older in this one they're once again dropped off at a hotel and kids are being killed john has this penchant for not being there when the monster is killing kids 
uh, because that's not the hunt apparently that he's on. He's he's off hunting something else. Any other insights into the making of Dean Winchester from Drag Me Away From You? And I'll let anybody who has a thought jump in on that. I didn't see it. I stopped watching. Oh, I got Alan. a confession. It's true. Yeah, I stopped. Season eight pissed me off so much. I love season yeah. eight. Season nine pissed me off. Yeah. <laughs> Season season fifteen did piss me off, so that 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 is kind of a valid choice. I I think one of the most interesting things, and and actually, I was even thinking about going back to the other ones we've just been talking about. The thing is with Dean, it takes him a long time. Like you said, uh, he realizes that John made a choice. He could have been there. I think part of him realizes that, but he is so defended against that awareness that I don't think it ever really seeps into consciousness. Uh -huh. he, it, that's too threatening for him. He only has one parent left. And when a child only has one parent, they're going to put that parent on a pedestal because they need somebody to be sort of the good parent. And they will do a lot of manipulating and massaging mm -hmm. to keep somebody in that mold. And I think Dean really does that. And he's still doing that in that, in that flashback in season 15 i think he's supposed to be like 13 in that one so yeah. i don't know he seems actually older in that one to me and sam is already thinking about going to college which would make him a nine-year-old thinking about going to college yeah. which makes absolutely zero sense to me so but that's season 15 but i think you know dean at that point <laughs> <laughs> whatever Word. hand wave yeah. but i think at that point and even even maybe up until the the 18 he's still in pretty good denial. He's still saying what we do is important. What I do is important. I, you know, dad did the best he could. I mean, when the show picks up in real time, when he's 26, he's still in that mindset. It takes a long time for him to work himself around to, okay, actually, John did do a lot of things that weren't fair and a lot of things that, that really did have a bad impact on me. The most painful part of that drag me away from you is the when Dean finds out that Sam might be for some reason as a nine year old thinking of <laughs> going to college and and he he like makes fun of him and it was it was pretty mean. I don't know if the actor who was playing Dean just didn't have the chops to kind of make it a little nuanced. I feel like if it had been a Jensen line, he would have been able to make it work, but it came off. Yeah really really mean. mean with an edge okay. to it that dean doesn't usually have around sam even when he's threatened and clearly he was threatened feeling like he might be abandoned um he does try to apologize to sam later but he also is is it's a little bit of a it's dean like always wanting to fall back on this but sam we made a good team back there because ultimately he really he really can't go there to thinking about losing sam even at that point and that's what pissed me off about season eight. I just remembered it it was literally the scene where Sam has like a birthday cake, right? With that girl. And he's like, I never had a birthday cake before. I'm like, that's just a lie. There's just no way that Dean didn't do anything for Sam's birthday ever. That's just bad yeah. writing. That's Even like, if it was know, like, you know, true. a ding dong with a candle. In it. Exactly, a cupcake with a candle. There's no way it didn't happen. And then I was like, these writers have not watched. A stolen three. cupcake with a yeah. candle. But it, there's no it way. The frosting's a little candle. smushed on one side. Yeah. 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 And I was like, that's it. I don't think these writers have even read, watched the previous seasons. I don't think they know well. care. There's well, a lot of that in season 15. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. And really, no. this episode, I remember watching it and I was just like, yeah. talk about made out of whole cloth. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just not even buying any of this. This is not, this is not the Sam and Dean as we know them. And we saw evidence. Although, of so many, although you know. the, the second, I think it's the second yeah. to last episode, the one where Dean is like in the pat, like in Mary's brain where. Oh, no, no. I just like mean this that, one episode. They came round. They came round yeah. to no, sort just of like understanding. Episode just Dean this flashback episode childhood. where yeah. they're doing this case as kids again i right. felt like yeah. they had no yeah. idea what happened in earlier flashbacks to build on those characters already and they just kind of you know yeah yeah whipped yeah. up some ramen and called it a called it a day <laughs> Melissa, um can we talk about i dean's real dad for just a moment death Bar door 
Dean is playing catch with Bobby. And that is just yeah. one of my favorite little snippets of the entire season because it's just, here's a little tiny slice of normal. And it just tells us like everything about Bobby because he's like, he's going to try to have these kids, when the kids are with him, to give them a little bit of normal. And yeah. so I just, that, that's truly A plus parenting right now. You can't yeah. have Bob, you can't have Dean and Sam without Bobby. Like you can't talk about him without Bobby. And it's it's where Dean got. I mean, Dean is resilient. He look at all that he comes to. He's amazingly resilient. And you would think that somebody who's been through everything he's been through and had all this sort of emotional manipulation that he would just crumble and be fragile. But he's had he's had good people in his life. You know, Bobby was that figure. Sonny at the boys' home was that figure. Like there have been people throughout his life who have stepped up and kind of given him another model. And I think that goes a long way towards his resilience. Being he was a good, I'm sorry, Kara, go ahead. No, I'm just, being that this has all pretty much been all the canon discussion, I vote we have a second panel where we can talk about growing up Dean Winchester in the, in the fanon <laughs> <laughs> and explore well, all these other avenues. <laughs> Well, speaking of which, we have now blown through our time, so we absolutely do need a new panel. Obviously. And so before we go, let's take a quick round so everybody can say where we can find you online and uh, whatever projects you're involved in related to Supernatural, uh, please let us know. Uh, Carol? Uh, you can find me on Facebook and I will be on lots and lots and lots of continual panels and in the TFWNC group. All of my supernatural fan fiction is on AO3 under Fire Sign 10. Mind the tags. <laughs> and as Ellis Colton, I am an MM romance writer, and my debut novella, Prescription for Love, is now on Amazon. Very good. Amy? Um, yeah, you can find me on Facebook. That's most place that I am under AE Wasp or Amy's Wasp Nest out there. And I have not. I wrote fan fiction, but I'm not going to say <laughs> Anna knows. <laughs> um, it's great. Uh, and I'm starting a, like a urban fantasy series. So I finally get to at least get a little bit in there. If I could write a character as complex as Dean Winchester, I would be happy. Like that it's goals, you know, because we can talk about him for forever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lynn? Uh, you can find me on all social media at Fangasm SPN. You can find my books about Supernatural written with the actors. Family Don't End With Blood and There'll Be Peace When You Are Done. Awesome. Uh, and also my new book on the boys, Soups Ain't Always Heroes, on my website, <laughs> fangasmthebook.com. Very good. Anna? You can find me at my website, annakensing.com, most of the social media places. So my active participation waxes and wanes, depending on how much I am procrastinating oh. writing. And yeah. Janet? You can find me everywhere as Janet Walden West. Um, and I'm mostly hanging out in my reader group on Facebook now. Um, and the fifth book in my Region 2 Monster Hunter series will be out this spring. And Melissa. You can find Kitty and I talking about Supernatural here on Continual. I'm pretty easy to find at KelseyMartin.com, MorganBryce.com, spell them right and you'll find me. And those are the names I use on all the social media as well. I run the Supernatural TFWNC group on Facebook. I'm a columnist for the Winchester Family Business Blog. But uh, most of the time, I am here on Continual. So thank you very much. This was a terrific discussion. I can't wait until we can pick it back up and go from here. Thanks to all of you for watching and listening. There will be more Supernatural coming up soon on Continual. So we'll see you online. <laughs>